This is chapter 11, and we are going to be talking about cancer screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And I'm going to go through these one at a time, um, and I'm going to have this split into two videos. So in the first half, I'll talk about cancer screening, diagnosis, and I'll begin discussing a couple of different treatment methods, um, which I'll then continue in the second half, where I'll specifically focus on chemotherapy and some new emerging cancer treatments. All right, so let's begin with cancer screening. And, you know, because cancer is really a collection of so many different diseases and so many different tissues of the body, there is no, you know, just one hallmark symptom that allows you to say, oh, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, is going to allow us to detect cancer. So instead, the American Cancer Society gives a list of these seven warning signs that might indicate cancer. And they are, you know, change in bowel or bladder habits, if you've got a sore that's not healing, any unusual bleeding or other discharge, um, a lump obviously could indicate a tumor, um, if you have indigestion, difficulty swallowing, some visible obvious change in a wart or in a mole, um, cough that won't go away, hoarseness of, of voice, um, you know, Again, none of those are, are uniquely specific to cancer. They could all indicate something else, but if you have one or more of these, you should probably go see the doctor, and it could, could be an indicator of cancer. And as you're probably aware, right, early detection is going to very likely improve survival rate. For sure, it's going to improve... Uh, five-year survival rate type numbers, which is what we're looking at here. Remember, this is the percentage of people that are alive at five years from diagnosis. And do keep in mind, early detection can skew these numbers a bit due to lead time bias that we discussed in a previous chapter. But for, sh for sure, clearly here for all these different types of cancer, if the cancer is detected before it is metastasized while it's still local, which is the green bars here, there are much higher five-year survival rates than if it is metastasized, right, spread distantly through the body. Uh, five-year survival percentages drop dramatically in that instance. So for sure, early detection is going to be ideal. And I want to go through a few of these uh, common techniques and talk about a couple of newer ones. Um, you know, a, a traditional famous one is the pap smear, right, screening for cervical cancer, which as you'll read in the Emperor of All Maladies book was uh, invented uh, or popularized, I guess, in the 1930s by this, uh, <coughs> this uh, researcher, George Papanicolo, um, hence the name, the, the pap smear. Um, and it is simply, right, scraping some cells off the cervix, literally smearing them on a slide and looking at that slide on the microscope. And, you know, if you see something like this in the top image, some quote-unquote normal-looking cells um, versus something that would be cancerous or precancerous like you see on the bottom here, it could be a very cheap, simple, relatively easy screening technique. And this has been used very successfully to pretty dramatically reduce cervical cancer rates. So they estimate it's dropped the cervical cancer uh, death rate by more than 75%. So what is going on in this uh, bottom slide here? Well, you're, you're looking for a few different things. So, you know, are you seeing uh, lots of variation in cell shape and cell size for sure? Irregular nuclei, yeah, you're... You're seeing that in this image as well. Lots of cells that are actively dividing. That check, right? All these things are happening in that, that lower image. So any of these could be a sign of cervical cancer or precancer. Um, but you're really going to need to go back in and do a biopsy and take a little bit more detailed look to confirm. But again, quick, easy, cheap screening method. Then we have the mammogram, right, for breast cancer, and this is basically uh, taking an x-ray of the breast tissue to create a, a fairly detailed image. Um, 
And, you know, there's a couple of controversies surrounding uh, mammograms. One being that you're using x-rays, which as we discussed, is high energy radiation that can cause cancer, right? So you're using a method to detect cancer that can potentially also cause cancer. Um, and then there's also been some controversy over who should actually get mammograms, who's going to benefit the most. Uh, I think for a long time it was recommended for all women over 40 or 45, but recently um, those recommendations have been changed and it's suggested really that only women over 50 and or women that you know have some familial history, mother, sisters, aunts with breast cancer, um, should be the ones that are <clears throat> getting mammograms. And in particular, the data shows that for the second group here, women over 50, you know, getting your routine yearly mammogram can pretty significantly reduce your risk of dying from breast cancer up to up to 30 percent. So uh, I wanted to throw in a new interesting method for screening for breast cancer that is actually looking at protein um, proteins in tears. So this company has created this device where the the technician or physician basically just collects a, a couple of tears, puts them in what's essentially a, a little collection slide here, and then the uh, proteins in that tear sample are analyzed. And I'll, I'll talk about proteomics here in a minute. Um, and I haven't looked at this uh, research article in great detail, so I'm not exactly sure which, you know, what proteins uh, they're looking for, but they have identified some particular signature protein signature that is linked to breast cancer and that can be detected in tears. Um, so, you know, that's that's pretty exciting because obviously collecting a, a tear or two is, is significantly easier and definitely poses less of a cancer-causing risk than, uh, than x-ray and mammography. Then there's the colonoscopy, right? Screen for colon cancer, where traditionally you would, uh, you know, snake a, a camera up into the colon and basically visibly inspect for either polyps, you know, sort of precancerous benign tumors or something that, that, that could be uh, a little bit more sinister. And the, the colonoscopy cameras are equipped with uh, biopsy capabilities so you can take biopsies, uh, take tissue samples in the same process. But obviously that uh, can be uncomfortable, right? You got to to like spend a whole day basically clearing out your system before you can get a colonoscopy. So it's a bit of an ordeal. Uh, and you may have seen some of these commercials, but they have uh, some new screens like uh, ColoGuard, where you basically put a fecal sample uh, in the mail, right? Send it off to this company. Um, and they're basically going to just extract DNA from uh, fecal samples because there's going to be some intestinal cells in those samples as well, enough to get DNA from, and then they're going to use that DNA to test for things like APC mutations, right, which are commonly found in colon cancers. You remember we talked about this gene with uh, one of the familial inherited types of colon cancer, but you will see APC mutations in sporadic colon cancers as well. Then we do have some blood tests that can be used for screening. Probably the most famous is the PSA test for prostate cancer. PSA stands for prostate serum uh, antigen. And if you have elevated PSA levels, that could indicate prostate cancer, but could also be due to infection or inflammation in the, the prostate. So that's not doesn't necessarily uh, uh, mean cancerous. Prostate. Um, there are a few other uh, pretty widely used blood tests as well. There's the alpha fetoprotein that can detect uh, liver cancer, the CEO antigen, um, which can detect a few different types of cancer, 
and CA125, which is a marker for ovarian cancer. And again, even though all of these tests can be very useful in terms of screening patients or if you have a patient that's been diagnosed and treated to um, sort of screen for recurrence, um, none of these are going to be definitive on their own. So in all cases, you're going to need some, some further tests and a biopsy to really try to figure out if cancer is present or not. Um, I wanted to include this. I came across this article from a couple of years ago um, where researchers developed what they're calling a multi-analyte blood test. So there's a single blood test that could screen for up to eight different types of cancer. Right? Um, so that's, that's pretty awesome that you could just go do a blood draw and um, you know, screen for some of the, the more common types of cancer. Um, get that done every year with your physical. And same, same thing holds true here, right? None of these are going to be definitive in terms of diagnostics, but they can be a useful first screen. All right, so a lot of these tests, these blood tests, uh, would be utilizing what I, what I mentioned was proteomics. And the proteome just is all the proteins in a cell, just like the genome would be all the DNA in a cell. And so proteomics is the science of basically analyzing, profiling those proteins, right? Looking to see what proteins are present or are not present and in what amounts. And typically proteomics is going to utilize techniques like mass spectr spectrometry um, to be able to uh, visualize what proteins are present and in what amounts. Although there are some other newer techniques that are being used as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of excitement around proteomics. Um, in terms of medicine and specifically in terms of cancer medicine um, because they can be very very powerful as, we, as we've seen in terms of their ability to screen for multiple cancers. So really with any of these types of screening methods whether you're talking something high-tech like proteomics or lower tech like a pap smear um, the big potential problem with any screening method is either false positives or false negatives. And really these, these screens have to walk a very, very fine line. So let's, let's take another screen, the fecal occult blood test, which is simply screening for you know, trace amounts of blood that could be found in feces. This could be an indicator of colon or, or stomach cancer, for example. And this uh, fecal occult blood test, in terms of screening for colon cancer, has a specificity of 98%. So there's only 2% false positives. So you see that number and you think, oh, well, that's great, right? I would be totally happy if I could get a 98% on my next exam. That's a high A. That's, that's excellent. But if we actually look at some numbers here, so in the U.S., we only expect about 55 cases of colon cancer in a population of 100,000 people in, uh, each year. So let's say we gave 100,000 people just randomly the fecal occult blood test. Uh, with that 2% false positive rate, we would expect 2,000 false positives or 2,000 positives, and that's in a in a population where only 55 of those would be expected to be real actual cases of colon cancer, right? So that's a lot of people being, you know, unnecessarily worried and having to have follow-up uh, doctor visits and, and colonoscopies, um, you know, potentially unnecessarily. So even, you know, 98% specificity um, may not be enough, right? So these screens really, really need to be uh, very, very accurate, have a very low percentage of false positives or false negatives. Um, all right, so let's switch from screening into diagnosis here. And hands down, biopsy is the best way to diagnose cancer, right? You can actually look at the tissue, look at the cells um, that you're concerned about. 
Um, you know, of course, in some cases, because of the location of a, of a tumor, biopsy may not be possible, and you may have to rely just on imaging techniques. And there are a lot of very good um, ways to image inside the body now, not only x-ray, but CT scan and MRIs and even ultrasound has gotten much more detailed than it used to be. And of course, you know, these imaging techniques can also be used in terms of screening as well. And when a cancer is diagnosed, they're distinguished as either in situ, meaning they are still in place and have not metastasized or, or spread out of the original tissue, uh, or they're considered invasive, meaning they have spread, right? And as we've talked about, it is, of course, ideal to catch, catch them in situ rather than after they've already begun spreading. And um, not only is diagnose, diagnosis, initial diagnosis important, but being able to accurately predict recurrence is also a big deal because, of course, as we're aware, you know, even if you have been uh, successfully treated for a particular cancer and are in remission, um, you know, depending on the cancer type and the specific case, there may be a significant chance that cancer could return down the road. So one uh, more modern approach uh, researchers have been using is using gene expression analysis to try to predict recurrence. And they'll use microarrays, which is, uh, again, it's this technique that basically allows you to look at the expression patterns of a large number of genes in, in one single experiment. And so using these microarrays, uh, they found these 21 uh, most important genes that seem to be a good predictor of breast cancer recurrence. So depending on whether those 21 genes are being more highly expressed or, or less expressed, uh, may give you some indication of recurrence potential. So this test is called the Oncotype DX, and it can generate what they call a recurrence number that would classify you into either low, intermediate, or high risk for recurrence. And so, uh, you know, this is something you'd want to know, not only as a patient, but if you're a, an oncologist or a physician treating a patient who's had breast cancer, you would want to know, you know, do they have a 5% chance of recurrence or a 35% chance of recurrence that could uh, make a big difference in terms of you know, how frequently you want to follow up and how aggressive you want to be in additional screening uh, down the road. All right, then uh, in terms of treatment, I'm going to distinguish between traditional cancer treatments, which would be things like surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and then newer emerging treatments, stuff like uh, immunotherapy, molecular targeting, targeting oncolytic viruses that could be used to uh, treat cancers. So I'm going to start here in this first half uh, talking about surgery and radiation and then I'll pick up chemotherapy in part two and talk about some of the emerging treatments there as well. All right, so let's start with surgery. And if you catch a cancer early, especially if it's still in situ, um, surgery can cure cancer, right? If you can remove all the cancer cells, then that patient is effectively cured. Um, and if, if we think of surgery, there's quote-unquote traditional surgery, meaning we're using the, the knife, right, the scalpel to, to literally cut out the tissues. But there are some other variations that can be commonly used, so laser surgery using the, you know, the high energy in a laser to either cut out or vaporize cells, um, electrosurgery where you're using an electrical current to destroy the cells during the surgical process, cryosurgery, using liquid nitrogen to freeze, uh, deep freeze and kill cells, and high intensity uh, focused ultrasound, where you're using acoustic energy to basically heat up and, and kill the cells during the surgery. Here you have a surgeon practicing that technique. 
Um, but you know, regardless of which which surgical technique you're using, right, the goal is to either destroy or remove those those cells in the process. Um, and speaking of destroying cells, that is really the main goal of radiation, right? We've already talked about the fact that radiation, uh, the high energy associated with radiation can cause cancer, but it can also be used to uh, selectively kill cancer cells, ideally while minimizing damage to any normal tissues. And what clinicians have found over the years is that it seems like treating patients with multiple smaller doses of radiation accomplishes this goal a lot better than just blasting away with one large dose. Um, so if you if you treat with just one, a single large dose, you basically don't get very good delineation between killing cancer cells and killing normal cells. They're both being killed at about the same rate. Whereas if you treat with multiple smaller doses, uh, you do get a little bit better separation there and more preferentially kill those uh, rapidly dividing cancer cells. Um, you know, there's a number of different ways to do radiation treatments. Um, one interesting variation is called brachytherapy, where you actually insert a little radioactive seed, radioactive source, uh, in the body close to the tumor. So this has been used in a number of different cancer types. I know if you have like partial uh, removal of prostate due to prostate cancer, sometimes they'll, they'll commonly do this just to be able to do sort of a lasting low level of radiation of uh, uh, remaining tissue that may contain some cancer cells as well. As well. Um, we have some pretty sophisticated um, types of radiation delivery equipment now. I don't know if you've ever heard of CyberKnife, but it's this big uh, radiation source, x-ray source, um, that can basically uh, deliver a very, very focused beam of high-dose radiation. So these can be used for treating things like brain tumors, right, where you really need to be very specific with uh, which tissues uh, are receiving the, the radiation dosage. And I mentioned earlier in the semester, you know, my wife had a, a brain tumor uh, about 15 years ago, and she had this, this kind of treatment. And uh, basically what they would do in the case of a brain tumor is they create this kind of plastic mesh mask that's customized to the individual's face, and then that mask gets screwed down onto the table. So you've got the patient laying here on the table, and so that's going to prevent their head from moving, you know, even a millimeter in, in any direction. So they're completely immobilized, and then the, the cyber knife machine can position itself to, you know, deliver a, a beam of radiation at the very precise angle and to a, a very precise part of the brain tissue. And it's also been known for quite a long time that different cancers will respond differently to radiation. Some are very, very responsive, very sensitive, so like Hodgkin's uh, lymphomas, uh, neuroblastomas, retinoblastomas seem to respond really well. You've got a group here, things like lung, breast, prostate, that will respond, eh, okay. And then uh, some that really don't respond well at all, glioblastomas and pancreatic cancer, melanomas. Um, you're almost wasting your time with radiation on some of those guys. Uh, there are some tricks that can be used, though, to make some of these poorly or moderate, moderately responsive cancer types more sensitive. Um, there's some drugs that can be used that are called hypoxic radiosensitizers. Uh, they're basically mimicking oxygen. They get taken up by the cells, and then they'll essentially amplify the, uh, the harmful effects of the radiation in terms of being able to damage the DNA in those cells. Um, another technique that can work that's pretty simple is uh, called hyperthermia, so simply raising the temperature of the cells in the tumor by a few degrees can also increase uh, sensitivity to radiation. Okay, I'll uh, continue this in part two, again talking about uh, chemotherapy and some emerging treatments.